Every now and then, remember what the world felt like when you were small. And looking down at them, I see it hasn't changed at all. So while they're standing beside you, won't you tell them the score? Won't you tell them the story of the days in the way back when? Every now. This is the attic of our house. Did you ever play the game called 20 Questions? You know, where you think of something and the other players ask you questions about it, and you can only answer yes or no to them? We played in the car all the time. Well, when you were answering yes or no, you were acting just like a computer. You mean the computer plays 20 questions with itself? Actually, the computer asks itself millions of questions each second, and each one is like a little switch that can only be off or on, yes or no. They must be the fastest switches in the world. You bet. So when you ask the computer a question, or type in a command, and it comes back with a result in a second or two, it does it by playing a little electronic version of 20 million questions right there in front of you. This is the attic of our house. Today's pens and pencils cost so little that we forget what fine machines they actually are. Rollerball pens, for example, send out a smooth, even flow of liquid ink without leaking or blotching in hot or cold weather. Some even write upside down and underwater. And mechanical pencils engineered to perfectly fit the shape of your hand let you write with lead no wider than half a millimeter. Just right for your math and science homework. Ballpoint pens were just becoming popular when I was a kid. The ink lasted a whole lot longer than the ink in a fountain pen, and they didn't leak all over. But even so, we weren't allowed to use them for our schoolwork. Our teachers didn't like the way they left little ink blotches on our papers every time the pen changed direction. It made our writing look messy at the very time they were trying to teach us good penmanship. But the main reason we couldn't use them was that the ink was indelible. Once you wrote a word, you almost had to erase a hole in the paper to get rid of it. Talk about messy looking papers. When my mom sat down to write a letter, she needed not only pen and paper, but also an inkstand, ink bottle, and blotter. You see, her pen didn't have its own supply of ink. She would dip a pen point into the ink bottle, write a few words, blot them dry, dip her pen into the inkwell, and write a few more, and so on. Writing a page of script was quite an art, I should know. My first attempts left more ink stains on the paper than words, and more ink on my fingers than on the paper. Father always made sure his knife was sharp before setting to work making a supply of goose feathers into quilled pens. You see, goose feathers were in plentiful supply in our area, and were just about the right size for a pen, big enough to hold a good supply of ink without running out. How did the feathers hold the ink? Well, feathers are hollow on the inside. They have to be, or the poor bird would never get off the ground. So, if you take this hollow feather and make a little angled cut at the very tip, where it begins to narrow, then when you dip the feather into your inkwell, ink will fill up the hollow inside of the feather. But if you didn't make a smooth cut in the quill with a sharp knife, the ink would run out onto the paper unevenly, and your work would be ruined. Ink comes from all sorts of places. For hundreds of years, for example, inks of different colors were made from the crushed flowers and leaves of plants. But the blackest ink of all is called India ink, made from lamp black. 
What's lamp black? Did you ever see the black rime that collects on glass globes near a burning candle or oil lamp? Sure. You can even see it in the smoke sometimes. Right. Well, that soot is called lamp black, and that's where India ink came from. This is the attic of our house. Like many other appliances in our house, today's sewing machines are controlled by tiny onboard computers which make them very powerful and also easy to use. You can set or program any one of dozens of different kinds of stitches, adjust automatically to the different fabric thicknesses, even sew with two needles at once. Now you may think that a sewing machine powered by your own two feet is a terrible inconvenience, but that sure isn't how we looked at it back in the 20s when I was a young girl learning to sew. It was either that or run all the stitches by hand. And when you spent most evenings after supper either mending clothes or making new ones, you loved anything that would lighten the load. How did it work? Well, the treadle was connected to a type of pulley, and a leather belt went from the pulley up to the drive wheel at the back end of the sewing machine. When you rocked your feet back and forth, the pulley moved the sewing needle up and down, much faster than could ever have been done by hand. I remember the quilting parties that my mother and I attended when I was a girl in President Washington's day. Women came from miles around. It was one of the few chances we had to sit and socialize and to put our hands to good use at the same time. In the summer, we'd sit out in the fresh air and use the long hours of daylight, while in the wintertime, the party would move indoors and we'd sew by hearth and candlelight. Now Mother was an excellent seamstress. Her squares were some of the most finely stitched in the quilt, so you can imagine how proud I was when she finally said my own sewing was good enough to join with the other women. It was like I'd grown up. This is the attic of our house. One of the best things about an attic is that it's kind of a large treasure chest. Almost anything can find its way up there. Sometimes the stuff is just junk, but sometimes family heirlooms, old-fashioned pictures, century-old diaries, and other relics are hidden. The funny thing is, as the world changes faster and faster, memories of everyday life and days gone by seem more important to us, even more than historical events. My parents, for instance, saved the daily newspapers whenever great events occurred, like when Neil Armstrong took his first step on the moon. But they didn't just clip the headlines, they saved the whole paper. And now it's more fun to read the sports page from that day, or the local news and editorial columns, because that's where you find out how people really lived and what they worried about, and even how much they paid for a car, or a loaf of bread for that matter. So you see, whatever might be in your attic, the most important treasure you can find there is your own past, because it's like finding a missing part of yourself. This is the attic of our house. Now, when you look into the attic floor, you're also looking at the second floor bedroom ceilings, you know. It's the same thing. Beneath the floor are strong pieces of lumber called joists and they do a couple of jobs. First, they help hold the walls of the house apart. Second, they hold the walls of the house together. And of course, they separate one floor from another. Water pipes and drains, air ducts and electrical wires all make their way through and alongside the floor joists. And they're covered on top with plywood to make the attic floor, and on the bottom with plaster or sheetrock to make the bedroom ceiling.
This is the attic of our house. A computer workstation is simply a modern desk designed especially to accommodate a personal computer and all the equipment that accompanies it. Like printers, you mean? Right. And CPUs and monitors and keyboards and speakers and disc holders, any number of things. The trick is to fit all these things into the space of a standard desk, while at the same time paying attention to the comfort and safety of the user. You see, an old-fashioned desk was designed for writing and typing, storing pens and paper and whatnot. But at a computer age workstation, work gets done in a far different fashion. My pop's big oak roll-top desk was easily the most magical piece of furniture in the house. Mom sure didn't think so. She called it Pop's White Elephant and said it took the exact spot where a piano should be. Well, that old roll-top was big, that's for sure. It occupied an entire corner of our living room. It must have had 50 little cubby holes hiding there under the roll-down lid. And my sister and I used to sneak in and rummage through them when we thought he wasn't around. In them, he kept his pipe, a beat-up old baseball, a high school picture of Mom, a couple of scribbled drawings that we kids gave him when we were toddlers, and one or two of his favorite books. The drawers on the bottom weren't nearly as interesting. They had bills and checks and account books and stationery. But the cubby holes behind the roll top, it was like going through a little museum of my pop's life. Mother's younger brother, Ezra, enlisted in the Union Army during the spring of 1862. Before he left, they promised to write each other once every week while he was gone, and each was faithful to that promise. Every Friday evening, Mother got out her lap desk, kind of a flat wooden box with a slanted top, and wrote Ezra a long letter in which she told him of news of family and home. And when she received letters, sometimes months would go by without one, then two or three would come in one pack packet. She'd read them aloud to us, then carefully place them inside her lap desk. My Uncle Ezra fell in battle, shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg in the summer of 1863. Mother bound his letters in a black ribbon along with a newspaper account of Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg address, and they remained in her lap desk for the rest of her life. Now, Yankee craftsmen produce some of the finest wood furniture the world has ever seen in Washington and Jefferson's day. Writing desks and secretaries, Philadelphia high boys and sideboards with hand-carved fronts, oh, they were wonders of the world. But the most comfortable piece of furniture my father ever used was a simple cherry wood standing desk. While others preferred to sit at their desks to work, Father could spend all morning composing letters standing comfortably at his desk. Standing was better for his back, he said. Too many coach journeys over bad roads had left him with something of a condition. And besides, he always thought better on his feet anyway. <laughs> 